Thank you to those in the room and thank you to everyone joining online for being here today. This is really a day of celebration of science in our Department of Surgery at the University of Toronto. And we recognize contributions in terms of investigation and research by surgeons in our department. Um, the Peters and Lister Prizes are chosen and announced in the spring of the year before this lecture. And this lecture is an opportunity for the winners of the prizes to present their work and give you some idea of what their research programs consist of. So for this morning, I'm very happy to introduce our Peters Prize winner. The George Armstrong's Peters Prize is given to a quotes, young investigator. And I think today we have a truly young investigator who uh, has shown outstanding research productivity during their early years of appointment to our faculty. And today we have to speak with us near Lipsman, who is a neurosurgeon at Sunnybrook and Andy Smith is in the house. Andy, uh, obviously very proud of Nir's accomplishments to date. Um, Nir, uh, trained in our neurosurgery residency program here in Toronto, did his fellowship here, and has really established an international reputation for his use of focal ultrasound for neuropathology. Um, I can tell you, I've heard testimonials from patients and families in Toronto and across Ontario about uh, his breakthrough research. And so it's really a delight to welcome Nir to tell us a little bit about what he's been doing. Come up to the podium, please, Nir. Well, thanks very much, um, you all, for the kind introduction. It's an uh, absolute privilege and pleasure to uh, join everybody this morning. Um, and to give this uh, to give this university lecture, thank you so much uh, for everybody uh, for coming this morning in person and also uh, joining online and giving a part of your morning. Oh, right. Let's wait for that. So, um, as, as uh, Dr. Swall said, my name is Neil Lipsman. I'm a neurosurgeon at Sunnybrook, and um, I have the great uh, privilege to work alongside an outstanding team on neuromodulation, which is direct to brain strategies for uh, difficult to treat neurologic and psychiatric diseases. Uh, and I'll be talking about focused ultrasound. So it's um, it's a nice story, focused ultrasound, because it's a really it's a Canadian story. It's an emerging neurosurgical technology, uh, and one where um, I hope to highlight the, the journey from idea to to clinical implementation. So I thought uh, you know I'd be remiss uh, if I didn't talk a little bit about uh, my own journey uh, and what brought me here uh, today, this morning, and uh, to highlight some of the, the key people along the way, mentors and others who have imparted on me. Uh, important lessons that uh, really made it possible to do the work that we do. So my, my journey began at the University of Toronto where I did a research psychology degree. Uh, and my first mentors, uh, Peter Herman and Janet Polavy were social psychologists. Uh, and uh, they really imparted on, on me the- the, the uh, okay. The, uh, the importance of uh, how to approach and answer a scientific question, how to read beyond the headlines of a paper, uh, and how to challenge assumptions that are long held in our field. Uh, and really that's a debt I owe to them. Uh, I did medical school at Queen's University uh, where I wanted to be a psychiatrist for the first couple of years, uh, but then spent a bunch of time in Toronto where I met uh, who were really the St. Paul's of neurosurgery, uh, who are Chris Wallace and Jim Rutka. And, any medical student uh, would be challenged not to pursue uh, with a passion neurosurgery after meeting uh, these two mentors. Uh, and in fact, they set me on a course to, to pursue neurosurgery. Uh, and then I matched here in Toronto where it was my great privilege to, to meet uh, and encounter really global leaders in the field, people who became very close mentors, uh, partners, friends, uh, Drs. Bernstein, Failings, uh, who's here today, Dr. Schwartz, Dr. Zadeh, 
uh, and establish uh, lifelong friendships, which uh, in one uh, tragic uh, instance was cut short, unfortunately, uh, in Dr. Main Prize. Uh, and then it was uh, Dr. Lozano, who was my PhD supervisor and my fellowship supervisor, who really set me on a course of discovery during my fellowship. And, and as you'll see during my residency and my PhD years, on a course of discovery in, in functional neurosurgery and really got, got the ball rolling in focus ultrasound. And for him, I, I um, will forever be grateful. And um, then I became a, a neurosurgeon on staff at, at, uh, at Sunnybrook. And uh, that's when I uh, really uh, became clear the importance and value of having mentors outside of neurosurgery. And to that, I thank uh, Calerva Hinnanen, Avery Nathans and, and Dr. Smith who's here this morning uh, for their sage advice, wisdom over the years, sounding boards uh, for me uh, personally and helped guide my career so far. Um, so lots of people, lots of lessons to be learned. And although a tall order, um, I can probably summarize uh, the lessons that they've imparted on me as striving for impact uh, by challenging the status quo in our field while maintaining humanity and compassion for our patients, really keeping that center stage in everything that we do, but nevertheless trying to challenge uh, long held assumptions in our field and how can we do things differently? How can we do best by our patients? And to all of them, again, I say thank you. So um, along those lines, it was really a meeting in 2011 in Dr. Lozano's office. Uh, it was the second year of my PhD that he introduced uh, the idea of focused ultrasound uh, to me. At the time, um, having recently moved to Toronto was Professor Hinnanen, who was a physicist, moved to Sunnybrook, uh, and he was a pioneer in the area of focused ultrasound. And he was looking for a clinical partner, looking for somebody with whom we can now test this nascent, ascending, emerging technology in human populations. Uh, and to us, it was a natural, natural move. Um, the, the main way we had as neurosurgeons, as functional neurosurgeons to, to intervene in and influence the brain had long been with electricity. So whether it's radio frequency or deep brain stimulation, the main way you interact with the brain in a focal way has always been delivering electrical energy to the brain. And then the, the, the question becomes, you know, are there other forms of energy that you could use? And of course, that, uh, that answer is yes, and in focus ultrasound. So um, focus ultrasound is not a flash in the pan technology. It's been around since the 1940s, really, really a, a source of rigorous study uh, in the field. Um, but the main problem has been that you can use ultrasound throughout the body, but it's very difficult to use it inside the head because of the skull. And we'll get to that in a moment. But to many of us in the field who are actively trying to intervene in circuits in the brain, this immediately became apparent to myself, to Dr. Lozano in his office and to others in the field that here was a technology that could be very disruptive to the way we do neurosurgery, specifically in things like movement disorders. So you can either use it to replay and you can define disruption as either replacing entirely a tool that is existing that you're using or, or creating a new market where one doesn't exist. And focus ultrasound had the potential to do both. So different ways you can use ultrasound in the brain, and it's too, uh, too, too long a subject to talk about the myriad mechanisms with which ultrasound can in inter intervene in the brain. But there are two that I'll discuss, two that are the focus here of a lot of our work. The first is high frequency ultrasound with which you make a permanent lesion in the brain less invasively. And you do that by harnessing the power of multiple transducers throughout the, throughout the, 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 the helmet that we use. And then there's low frequency ultrasound, a different kind of technology where you're opening the blood brain barrier and delivering therapeutics uh, through a transiently open blood brain barrier, again, with acoustic energy. So this is the device that we use currently at Sunnybrook and is the most commonly used device throughout the world and the one that we've been using since 2012, approximately. Four main features of this focused ultrasound helmet. The first is that it's a frame-based procedure, which means that stereotactic frame is attached to patient's heads to keep it immobilized. We use cooled degassed water in order to provide a medium for ultrasound to travel through. We use real-time uh, three Tesla research MR in the basement uh, or in the ground floor of Sunnybrook. Uh, and we use a helmet that uses 1,024 transducers. So the initial ultrasound prototypes used four transducers. We're using over 1,000 currently. And this combines for a stereotactic, anatomically, spatially, and temporally precise image-guided access to basically any brain pathology that you want to access in a very, very precise way. So again, we've been using ultrasound in the medical field for many decades, using it to treat fibroids, prostate cancer, bone mets, and other diseases. 
Um, but the skull is a major issue for intracranial applications. And that's because it absorbs more than 99% of acoustic energy. It'll just absorb it. Even if you can get ultrasound through it, it's very difficult to redirect it after it passes the bone to refocus it. But that's only recently been overcome. And that's Professor Heinen, uh, who's now our Vice President of Research and Innovation at Sunnybrook, who is actually able to overcome that with that phased array helmet that, that I showed you there. So what we needed was a central millimeter sized target with a very clear behavioral assay that we can prove, in fact, for the first time that we can use this in human brains. And a central tremor became really the optimal initial application and proof of concept. So this is a central tremor. It's the most common movement disorder. It affects up to three or four percent of the population. Uh, very distinct from other tremor syndromes like Parkinson's and others, this predominantly affects uh, the upper extremities, but can affect virtually every part of the body. It's a very strong genetic component with 50% of patients having a strong family history for this. In its most severe form, as you can see here, it's completely incapacitating, it's debilitating for patients. Um, there are medical treatments that are effective, but in about two thirds of patients only. But a third of patients are completely refractory or they don't tolerate the medications and they become surgical candidates. So surgery for this uh, is available and has been available for some time. All surgical strategies are centered on the same region of the brain known as the VIM nucleus of the thalamus, which is an important relay structure between the cerebellum and the motor cortex. And you can do different things to the neurons in this part of the brain. You can kill them, destroy them with radio frequency or with focused radiation and gamma knife radio surgery. Or you can use deep brain stimulation, which is electrodes in the brain where you, you stimulate uh, the, uh, this region of the brain to basically knock it out uh, and, and, and disrupt activity there. So what are the advantages of, uh, of focused ultrasound, both to the surgeon and to the patient? Well, the first thing is that we can visualize in real time the heating of tissue. So we use MR thermometry and every three seconds we get feedback about how hot we're heating the tissue in a very focal way. In this case, reaching a peak of 59 degrees on average in top pixel was 62 degrees. We see the lesion develop in real time. Uh, so every patient leaves the scanner with a lesion made. This is very different from gamma knife radio surgery approaches where it takes months for the lesion to develop. And even radio frequency uh, is, 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 a, is, an, is an image guided, pre-operative image guided approach, but we don't see the lesion develop in real time. And procedures are done awake, so we can in real time visualize their, uh, their, their effects uh, immediately after. The vast majority of patients leave uh, the a scanner with a much improved tremor. So you can take a patient that looks like this immediately pre-operatively with a severe right upper extremity appendicular positional tremor, quite uh, disabled by it. Uh, it takes about two hours to generate a lesion uh, after targeting and the procedure. And immediately after the procedure, the tremor essentially uh, has abated and gone. And we're finding uh, the more we do this, the more efficient we become and the more substantial the effect is and the more durable the effect is uh, over time. So um, we started doing this uh, at Sunnybrook uh, in 2011. That's the first time uh, we asked for a research ethics submission. Uh, and one of my great uh, privileges has been working with Dr. Mike Schwartz, uh, neurosurgeon professor emeritus at, at Sunnybrook uh, in our division, really a legend of neurosurgery uh, in our department. And we've been working on this together for the last decade. Um, so we asked for research ethics permission in 2011 for the first patient in Canada, one of the first patients in the world to undergo this procedure. We treated the first patient in 2012. Uh, we published our case, our, our case series uh, in 2013, us and the group at the University of Virginia sort of co-published a month apart our experiences. And then we co-led a multi-center trial uh, between 2013 and 15 in 72 patients, eight centers around the world, ultimately showing that you can use this technology safely, effectively as an alternative to open neurosurgical approaches. Um, and that led to regulatory approval by Health Canada FDA in 2016. So that period of time from, from 2011 to 16, that six year period um, to go from idea, from research ethics submission to full regulatory approval is about a third of the time it takes a typical device to go from, from idea to, to market, to commercialization, really a reflection of the transformative potential of this technology for this particular indication. And this has changed the way we treat tremor uh, in many ways. So it got us thinking, 
you know, can we use this technology in other diseases and other conditions where making a precise targeted lesion in the brain is effective, has been used as an established tool. Can we now use this new tool for a very old established procedure in our surgery? And the answer, of course, was uh, yes, in our view. So obsessive compulsive disorder, major depression, highly refractory, highly difficult to treat diseases. Sunnybrook happens to be a major beacon of biological psychiatry. We see a lot of patients with mood and anxiety disorders. So uh, Ben Davidson, who's a neurosurgical resident, our chief resident currently uh, was in the lab um, and developed a trial where we looked at uh, the ability of ultrasound to generate uh, non-invasive capsulotomy lesions in the anterior limb of the internal capsule, a very important anterior thalamic radiation uh, pathway from the frontal lobe to the thalamus where we know a lot of these limbic circuits are driven by. And making non-invasive lesions is possible uh, in this disease. Again, something that's been done very long in neurosurgery for several decades, now we can do it entirely non-invasively. So not only can we do it, uh, we can do it effectively in essentially a day surgery procedure. All patients are discharged either the same day or morning after, no longer requiring multiple days in hospital, multiple tests, et cetera. And we have not found in our experience so far, and we've treated approximately 25 patients in the last four or five years uh, of any serious adverse events. The response rates are promising as well, with about 50 to 60% of patients seeing a significant response at one year, which is very similar to the open neurosurgical approaches. So we're achieving the same effects with a better safety profile uh, with similar efficacy rates. And this has contributed to a kind of change of conception of psychiatric surgery, which in our field, you know, there's a dark cloud hanging over us since the 1940s and 50s with psychiatric surgery at a time that was done very much uncontrolled, very much uh, unregulated. Uh, and uh, we have to, to sort of, uh, we, we suffer still with the consequences of, of surgeons in that era. And this has led to a kind of reevaluation of psychiatric surgery. Now you can do it in much more precise with millimeter precision, with image guidance, uh, in a multidisciplinary environment. And this has, as a result, led to increased interest in this technology. Um, and thanks to efforts at Sunnybrook, now uh, we've put together an application to the ministry to help fund uh, cases uh, to be done at Sunnybrook in a volume funding envelope, and that's currently under review. So I talked about high frequency ultrasound. I talked about making discrete lesions in the brain, basically replacing how we've made lesions in the past with this tool. But what about doing something that hasn't been done before? So creating a new market, using ultrasound to deliver therapies to the brain, opening up the blood-brain barrier. The idea here is that the BBB is a major challenge for the delivery of therapeutics, that overcoming this has been a kind of a holy grail for clinical neuroscientists for a very long time. There may be effective therapies that you want to get to the brain, whether it's in brain tumors or neurodegenerative diseases, but you just can't get them in sufficient amounts inside the brain in order to make a meaningful, significant impact. So the question becomes, can you use ultrasound to do just that? So the different attempts uh, so far have included things like uh, molecular mimicry approaches, uh, chemotherapy and pregnant polymers, um, open surgery, uh, direct catheters in the brain, so-called convection enhanced delivery, where, where you try to overcome uh, the brain's uh, or overwhelm the brain's blood-brain barrier by, by high bulk flow. All of these approaches have the same objective, overcoming the blood-brain barrier in a way that's safe and effective, but unfortunately, none of them have been effective to date. And when we looked at the literature, the animal literature, we've seen that over there have been over 400 preclinical studies and a whole host of animal models from small uh, rodent models to non-human primates that have shown that focus ultrasound can be used to achieve successful, temporary, and repeated and safe blood-brain barrier opening. Um, and when we looked and compared this to other technologies, there really is no other brain device, including you know, deep brain stimulation and others that have been as thoroughly studied from a safety perspective. Uh, and you can use this throughout the brain, even in highly eloquent regions of the brain, uh, whether it's primary motor or visual or other, or, or other uh, critical brain, brain regions. So we sought to leverage this in, in, in human trials. And one of the things um, uh, we're, we're quite uh, excited about is this work in breast cancer. So together with our, our radiation and medical oncology colleagues, we developed a trial where we used ultrasound to enhance the delivery of Herceptin, trastuzumab, which is a monoclonal antibody to patients with otherwise progressive intracranial breast cancer metastases that are HER2 positive. 
So um, we know that Herceptin, which is a, is a, it's a molecule that weighs about 150 kilodaltons, okay, the typical compound that can get into the brain across the BBB is 400 daltons, so it's several orders of magnitude larger, cannot get into the brain, and can lead to very exquisite uh, systemic control of breast cancer metastases, but patients often die of their intracranial disease. So here in patients that uh, have otherwise progressive disease in their brain, this is an example of a patient uh, with a lesion in the cerebellar peduncle, otherwise progressive. This is a patient from Ottawa that was referred to us. We can open the blood-brain barrier in a very precise way throughout the entire tumor, and we can visualize this in real time. You can see increased contrast enhancement. So contrast is gadolinium here. Gadolinium weighs one kilodalton, cannot go to anywhere in the brain where the BBB is not disrupted. And you can see that fluffy white gadolinium contrast um, that extends beyond the tumor go away the next morning. So this is transient opening of the blood-brain barrier uh, in a region of the brain that you don't want to operate in and in a region of the brain where, where this tumor is not resectable completely. And one of the neat things we did in this study is we worked together with Ray Riley at, uh, at the, in the pharmacy department who actually tagged trastuzumab with 111 indium. So for the first time, we can visualize this large molecule getting into the brain that previously cannot get into the brain. So here we have before and after shots of, gadolin, of, of uh, 111 indium trastuzumab pooling in the blood pools of the brain, the cavernous sinuses and the major venous sinuses, but not inside the tumor. And immediately after focus ultrasound, you see a significant binding uh, within the tumor where it wasn't before. So previous to this, highly theoretical. So we've shown those 400 preclinical studies. We've shown in our own work in Alzheimer's uh, and in, in glioblastoma that we can open the BPB. But this is the first hard and fast proof and evidence that you can get a large molecule antibody through the BBB to bind to tumors uh, and to get in there. So this was really served as a, uh, the impetus for, for larger trials in this area. So um, the, we thought, you know, if we can deliver large molecule uh, monoclonal antibodies, can we deliver other things to the brain? And one of the areas we're very interested in is Parkinson's disease. This is, uh, again, work that I'm privileged to work with the, uh, with the neurology and neurosurgery group at UHN, University Health Network, uh, Drs. Kalia and Kalia, neurology and neurosurgery partners. Uh, where we identified patients with a genetic form of Parkinson's disease that would benefit from the delivery of enzyme replacement therapy, an enzyme that is believed to be key to the pathophysiology of Parkinson's in this population. So the question becomes, can we transiently open the blood-brain barrier in a very discreet region of the brain known as the putamen, key part of the motor uh, basal ganglia structure? Can we do it in a precise way? Can we do it safely and reversibly? And can we also see biologic effects of, as a consequence of that? So here in the first patient that was treated, we can open the blood-brain barrier. You can see in a very, very anatomically precise way, essentially mapping out the putamen in this patient. You can see contrast enhancement immediately after, only in the putamen, you don't see it anywhere else in the brain. What was interesting in this study is we conducted FDG PET scans, so glucose PET scans looking at cerebral metabolism a month after the last treatment. So the BBB is only open for 12 hours after we do focus ultrasound. It's certainly closed by 24 hours, but it only lasts about 12 hours. This PET scan is done a month after the last treatment. And you can see significant hypermetabolism in the putamen, which is a marker of Parkinson's disease. The more progressive it gets, the more hypermetabolic the putamen gets. And you can see a month later, a significant reversal of that hypermetabolism. It's now hypometabolic only in the putamen that we treated. So a clear, what we believe, and we saw this in all patients, a clear biologic signal that we're having an impact on, on the metabolism biology of this, of this part of the brain. Um, very early days, very small trial, only in four patients. We just published this two months ago or a month ago, uh, but nevertheless, very early promising uh, clinical data to suggest that when you follow patients out, even to six months, there may be a promising uh, clinical benefit uh, in some of their motor symptoms. And again, what was interesting here, the patients who are homozygous for the deletion of the gene responsible for the enzyme deficiency actually benefited the most from enzyme replacement therapy. So it may very well be that this is a precise way to deliver therapeutics to the brain and patients that need it the most. So this is now the basis of a phase two trial that actually we just got a Health Canada approval for Friday last week. 
So what's been our experience so far? Uh, we've treated about, uh, we've done about 500 treatments at Sunnybrook uh, for multiple indications, both ablative uh, and blood brain barrier opening. So far, these are well tolerated, uh, transitioning to same day procedures. We have not found serious adverse events with BBB opening. We've done about 175 uh, treatments in this area. Uh, we can treat large multi-target volumes, even in eloquent cortex, no brain region is, uh, is not reachable with this technology. Uh, the technology is evolving in real time. It's a very different procedure that we're doing now than what we're doing a few years ago, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, if we were to invest uh, in things, uh, we invest in strategic partnerships, uh, both uh, with other disciplines and other hospitals uh, in the city and across the country, but also with industry and with our research institute. Um, investing a lot in regulatory support. A lot of this work is upfront regulatory support. 80 to 90% of the work and effort is in upfront regulatory work. So getting REB, getting Health Canada, working, working on uh, coordinating and regulating these trials. You may want to do this trial, but you need the manpower and human power to do that. And generating high performance teams. Really that for us is one, two, three, having people that wear multiple hats. And and we coalesced that around uh, the establishment of the Hartwell Center for Neuromodulation in 2018 through the generous support of the Hartwell family. And as a result, we're, we, we, we have the great, great fortune of, of having a significant impact on diseases across, across the board, really myriad indications in Parkinson's and, and neurodegenerative diseases and brain cancer and in psychiatry, really leading the way on a global stage uh, with applying this technology. We do that because we established a kind of modular format at our center, and we're very fortunate to have in-house expertise for a lot of these diseases, a lot of these conditions, so that we can run these trials independently, but learn a lot between these silos, between these platforms. Um, so what we learn in the neurodegenerative disease platform rapidly and quickly translates to the work that we do in cancer and then mental health, and the hope that over the coming years, uh, we'll add additional platforms uh, interested in traumatic brain injury, in spine applications, specifically spine pathology, as well as in stroke and neuroprotective strategies. So I mentioned that one of the exciting things is working on this technology in real time. I showed this earlier. This is what the technology looks like today. But in a couple of years, we're anticipating you know, dramatic changes. So currently we use a frame, but we're transitioning to frameless or pinless technology. Currently, for some indications, we have to shave the head. We're transitioning away from that. We no longer have to do that for some indications. We're using uh, uh, an MR right now. We're working on portable uh, uh, focus ultrasound, so we no longer have to use the MR uh, environment. And we're quadrupling the number of transducers from 1,000 to 4,000 to give you that exquisite control over focus ultrasound. So it's going to be a very different technology in the next, in the next couple of years. So to that end, um, I'll conclude with sort of a crystal ball. What's this going to look like in the next 5, 10, 15 years and beyond? Well, I think there's a significant diagnostic potential for focused ultrasound, especially if you pair it with imaging very early on in the scanner. When patients are asymptomatic, you see something uh, in the brain, whether it's a brain lesion or somebody has a mild cognitive impairment, you'll be able to biopsy the brain, open the blood-brain barrier, do some blood work and make a diagnosis. We're very much in the early days, but there's promising signs that we're going to be able to use this as a diagnostic tool. From a treatment perspective, enhance our ability to make lesions for sure but deliver disease modifying therapies, ultimately improving quality of life, but slowing the disease. Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are the major ones where there's desperate need for additional treatments, but specifically diseases that slow down the disorder. And uh, the, the major goal ultimately is prevention, You know, whether it's delivering vaccines, delivering genes uh, or other neuroprotective strategies, uh, whether it's in trauma, TBI or other disorders, uh, making a difference on the prevalence of, of these diseases in the population. So with that, I'll just acknowledge and thank the absolutely uh, world-class, tremendous team we have at Sunnybrook uh, to work alongside. I thank Kalervo Hinnanen, Dr. Smith for his leadership and the incredible team uh, that we've assembled uh, to make all of this work happen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again. That was just fabulous, Neil. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, I noticed you emphasize repeatedly the safety aspect and the high performance team that's required to achieve this. So, I was wondering if you could just comment briefly on translatability to smaller centers, um, remoter areas. 
Uh, the great, great question for sure. It still remains, and we still view it as a as a neurosurgical procedure requiring specific expertise. Uh, there are about uh, 200 centers around the world uh, currently that are doing the high frequency ablative work uh, right now. There are 20 doing the blood brain barrier work, and of those, the average uh, site, the average site that has both, uh, will have one or two clinical trials running, and we have we have about 13. So I think that you know, for for this to translate, it has scalability for sure, has to to reach reach the masses. But I think that for now, it does require that kind of expertise. As we're we're very much early days, even though we're we're we treated uh, uh, you know a few hundred patients, we're very much early days. It still requires that expertise, where you can see the uptake significantly in the tremor uh, world, uh, and you can see the direction that things are headed. But, uh, but that's where we're at. Near congratulations, like a really fantastic work and uh, it's just amazing to see kind of a translational pathway. So uh, just below the head is the spine and the spinal cord uh, is the, uh, the means to convey the messages from the brain. And uh, it's very difficult to deliver therapeutics to the spinal cord as well. So can you maybe just comment on what the potential is for the, these types of technologies to make an impact for spinal cord disorders, including things like ALS, spinal cord injury. Absolutely. Um, there's a researcher who you know, Megan O'Reilly, uh, at uh, the Sunday Recruits Institute, uh, where uh, this is a major focus for her in two ways. I think uh, where, you know, whether it's delivering therapeutics, I think we discussed, as we discussed, oncologic applications are, are the main ones. Um, typically the bone is going to be as big of a problem, the lamina is going to be as big of a problem in, in the spine as it is in the, in the skull, but for many of these indications, you do a decompression anyway in order to get in. So you get rid of the bone and actually makes spine applications a very natural uh, fit for this. Uh, so that's coming for sure. And we have several grants together that uh, we're hoping to develop in this area. Um, ALS, um, absolutely. Again, at Sunnybrook, we have the, a, a very large ALS clinic and, and and the problem with ALS, one of the challenges is what do you deliver? You know, what therapeutic do you deliver? And there, um, you know, that's where the technology will, will, will evolve together with a biologic uh, uh, application. So once we get a drug, we'll be able to get it. Thank you. So good morning, uh, I'm Michael Failings, Vice Chair. Uh, for research in the Department of Surgery. And it's my uh, pleasure and honor to um, announce the, uh, and to welcome the recipient of the 2022 Lister Prize in Surgery. And the Lister Prize is the uh, highest award that is given in the Department of Surgery. And it recognizes a um, major impact in a, a, a surgeon or a, a scientist in the Department of Surgery in the area of uh, research. And it's my uh, pleasure to um, introduce Professor Carol Swallow, our RS McLaughlin Chair of Surgery. And in brief, uh, Carol has had a very distinguished career and continues to make a major uh, impact. Um, I would say that Carol is really in her mid-career and is uh, doing fantastic work. And in brief, she's a graduate of our uh, surgeon scientist uh, training program. She's a mentee of Ori uh, Roth, Rothstein, having done her PhD in, uh, in cell biology and sepsis. And then Carol kind of switched gears and became very interested in oncologic work. She did a fellowship at Sloan Kettering and then came back to uh, the Mount Sinai, establishing a very uh, focused a, a clinical practice in a surgical oncology complemented with a translational research um, practice and she's also complemented this with um, uh, a mentorship of uh, many trainees um, as well as uh, a significant leadership having just completed a term as uh, division head in general surgery. So Carol, it's our honor to uh, welcome you as our 2022 Lister Prize winner. We look forward to your talk. I'll just say thank you to Sylvia, since I'm standing here beside her, <laughs> who uh, provides ass essential assistance uh, always. And thank you to Sahar, our communications officer, for being here and 
testing everything out. I hope it looks good. All right, good. Um, so it's, it's really a pleasure and an honor to uh, give the, the Lister Prize talk. And uh, mainly it's a pleasure because it gives me an opportunity to highlight the work of some of our trainees and graduate students who I've uh, been able to work with and learn from over the years. So that's my theme. Um, I'm gonna be talking about cancer therapeutics. And so I'll give you a little bit of um, overview of uh, my perspective on this. Over time, we had a fairly long period of, I would call it a stall or a plateau where uh, chemotherapy, which was cytotoxic, was the main kind of systemic therapy that was used. Oh, don't be put off, please come back. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, really little progress made in terms of overall survival or cancer control for almost 50 years. And then in the 90s, we started to see a breakthrough in terms of using specific targeted therapies um, in a, a precise way that minimized uh, other toxicities. And this has evolved into use of checkpoint inhibitors in the modern era to manipulate uh, the immune response to cancer. So very exciting developments over the past 20 years. And in parallel, surgery has obviously evolved itself. And surgery for cancer has become increasingly evidence-based, outcome-driven, and function-preserving. So I'm going to try to weave these themes together and talk about the surgeon as a targeted therapy. Um, targeted therapy really is based on the idea of targeting vulnerabilities, which are common to various types of cancer, uh, often referred to as hallmarks of cancer. And you see some of them listed here and the underlying genes uh, in which there are defects that create this vulnerability. Um, in order for targeted therapy to be effective, the target has to be robustly and reproducibly measured. So it has to be detectable. And also you have to recall, it has to be actionable. So just as Nir alluded to a few moments ago, you have to have a drug that's gonna work on that target. It's not good enough to just recognize the targets there. Um, you have to, so find the target in the patient and then apply the therapy. Uh, there are examples where this approach has been highly successful. And so if you can detect the expression of a key target, such as HER2, which Nir also referred to, you can give the patient Herceptin with the expectation that you're gonna have a good response. Another example is EGFR mutations in uh, non-small cell lung cancer, which have proven to be very targetable with uh, specific TKIs. However, our attempts to translate this whole concept into effective practice have been somewhat hampered. Um, and this is an example of a large scale trial that attempted to perform complex molecular analysis of the patient's tumor, the individual patient's tumor, I showed that that was feasible, but then actually applying an appropriate targeted therapy was a big barrier. And in this you know, over 6,000 patient prospective trial, the overall intention to treat response rate was about 5%. So frustrating. And uh, one of the cancers that I think is the most frustrating to treat in this regard is gastric cancer. So I'm going to talk about gastric cancer as a, a model and how surgeons can work with molecular oncologists and scientists to improve uh, where we're heading in the therapy of gastric cancer. Um, yes, there are a percentage of gastric cancers that have known targetable um, uh, abnormalities, uh, those that are EBV related and those that are deficient in mismatch repair are subject to immunotherapy and it could be quite successful. Uh, those that have HER2 you know, amplification, uh, again, Herceptin, Trastuzumab can be used effectively, but the vast majority of gastric cancers uh, don't have any identifiable potential target. 
just to give you a little bit of perspective on the importance of gastric cancer globally, um, it is the number three cause of cancer death worldwide. And it's also um, a cancer that affects different populations geographically uh, in a very, uh, I guess you could say, inequitable way with the incidence and mortality from gastric cancer varying a hundredfold depending on uh, where you live in the world. In Canada, uh, interestingly, uh, Newfoundland is a hotbed of gastric cancer incidence and mortality, and it also disproportionately affects Indigenous populations in the north of Canada. So gastric cancer is uh, fairly called hard to treat. Um, and there are several reasons for this. One is that about half of patients present with distant metastases, a diagnosis, and this can be in the liver. Uh, the peritoneal cavity is a prominent site. And at five years, the survival of someone with metastatic gastric cancer is expected to be less than 5%. In those who have curable disease, that is they're uh, receptible and they're um, candidates for adjuvant therapy, the results are also not that uh, wonderful. So by five years after curative intent resection in the best centers with the best treatment, we're looking at just under 50% survival. This is with people who have curable disease. And this is, uh, also reflected in our own experience here at Mount Sinai and UHN, Shelley Lou put this case series together. Um, and you can see we have about just over 50% survival at five years. So what could we do to try to figure out who needs adjuvant therapy more precisely? What could we do to see what the prognosis is of people with metastatic cancer and how we can affect it? How can we predict who's going to respond? Uh, conventional clinical pathologic factors don't allow us to do this very well. What about molecular features? And the Cancer Genome Atlas Research Network published this in 2014, a molecular classification of gastric cancer, uh, which was really based on multiple platforms of genomic analysis. And uh, unfortunately demonstrated, as I showed you before, that the majority of the patients have tumors that are either genomically stable, or chromosomally unstable, and don't have any real specific um, targetable abnormalities, at least currently. This is a similar analysis by the Asian Cancer Research Group uh, showing slightly different uh, results, as you can see here, and uh, still coming up with the final conclusion that most of the cancers have no specific target that we know of at the moment. Trying to condense this into something that's more easily applicable by doing gene expression signature analysis. Uh, this is an example from a group in China, and this was their validation cohort. So they did an initial cohort, developed this algorithm for uh, gene expression signatures. And you can see here that the signature analysis really didn't significantly improve classification compared to the old histologic classification. So no more precise prognostication. Um, analyses such as these, as these from China where they have many more patients have found various gene sets that are called um, key gene sets that are gonna predict patients' uh, prognosis. Uh, over time after curative intent resection. These are all primary cancers. And you can see that two of these gene sets that have been recently published share an overexpression of pololykinase 4, um, which I am very interested in because we have been working on this in my lab for many years. And uh, in these particular experiences, pololykinase 4 expression was predictive of a poor prognosis. So PLK4 is a really fascinating kinase, a serine threonine kinase that is auto inhibited. And when it dimerizes, autophosphorylates to become activated and then phosphorylate downstream substrates. It's very tightly controlled and it's a mitotic kinase um, that lives in the centriole basically. 
and is essential for centriolar duplication and therefore for normal mitosis to proceed. Um, in my lab, we've been really interested in non-centriolar functions of pololykinase 4. And this was uh, work done by Michael Coe several years ago, uh, where he demonstrated that pololykinase 4 was actually present at the spindle midbody and was important for cytokinesis to be completed, which gave us a hint that it might be involved in cell movement. And Carla Rosario, a graduate student, demonstrated unexpectedly that pololykinase 4 was localized to these protrusions of a motile cancer cell, as you can see here, um, and that it was important to this migration of cancer cells across space. This is work that Karina Kazazian did in a mouse xenograft model using a breast cancer cell line, showing that when you deplete pololykinase 4, you reduce the invasion of this xenograft breast cancer cell mass tumor into the surrounding skeletal muscle. And you can see here, you also reduce its ability to invade into the peritoneal cavity. Uh, pololykinase 4 and cancer, <laughs> Uh, just to summarize where we are right now, it's overexpressed in a wide variety of common human epithelial cancers, and especially in breast cancer, its expression is linked with poor prognosis. So overexpression of PLK4, poorer prognosis. Um, also providing some kind of stemness that makes cancers hard to treat effectively. So when Shelley Liu, uh, one of our SSTP trainees who recently graduated, when she started in the lab, it seemed like a sort of natural project to measure PLK4 in our gastric tumor bank, which Shelley actually created. And so she's now examined PLK4 expression in 158 patients in this cohort for whom she knows all the outcomes. These are patients who had curative intent reception. And you can see Shelley was not very delighted to, to get this result. There was really no difference in expression of PLK4 in tumor versus normal mucosa. So we went back to the drawing board looking for interactors that might regulate the activity of pololykinase 4 in gastric cancer. This is an interactome that was described by Karina Kazazian uh, based on bio ID screening. And this is a yeast two hybrid screen, the result of two screens. And you can see here, there's overlap between human and Drosophila only in four uh, genes. And uh, two of them are members of this FAM46C family. So FAM46C, we have done a lot of work recently in uh, describing the function of this fairly small innocuous looking protein, which up until about six years ago had no known function. And what Karina Kazazian has demonstrated is that FAM46C inhibits pololykinase activity. This is an in vitro kinase assay. And it also, if you add FAM46C, will suppress the invasion of cancer spheroids into surrounding matrix. So FAM46C, is an endogenous PLK4 inhibitor. This is a discovery that we made. So Shelley went back to look at the levels of FAM46C in gastric cancer. And very interestingly, it was really profoundly depleted in tumor versus normal mucosa, as you can see here. The majority of patients having low levels of FAM46C in their tumor. And that low level correlated with a poor prognosis. And this was uh, independently associated with poor prognosis. Um, our lab group went on to test the idea that FAM46C could affect tumors in vivo using a murine xenograft model. And you can see here, when you lower FAM46C levels, you get much bigger tumors. I think all of you, even Matan can appreciate that this is bigger than this, right? Um, and that's associated with less invasion uh, when you suppressed FAM46C. So this comes on to the topic of functional precision oncology. So instead of just detecting a target in the tissue, which is static, use patient-derived materials from the tumor 
to test responses um, in real time. So using dynamic features of the human tumor to test different therapeutics. And there are a couple of examples of systems that we can use um, to follow this line of thinking or this conceptual uh, model. So patient-derived organoids are one form of model that we can use. And this is a very simple diagram to illustrate the idea of breaking up the patient tissue into uh, cells and then creating an environment in vitro where stem cells are enriched and they then generate an organoid, which is similar to the uh, tissue in vivo in the patient. And this is work done by a medical student in my lab who spent a few summers with us um, to generate gastric tumor organoids. Um, and he was able to show that tumors that are intestinal in nature in, in the patient generate these glandular-like organoids. And tumors that are more solid or diffuse in patients generate these solid type organoids. Um, and then he's gone on to measure FAM46C levels in the organoids and compare it to the tissue from the patient. And you can see there is a correlation. What we're next gonna do is try to manipulate FAM46C um, in the organoids to see whether we can actually make a difference in real time to the way that these uh, tumors grow and then go back and test that in the patient. Um, Shelly Liu has extended her observations by studying the low FAM46C group of gastric tumors and finding that there's a difference in um, expression of various genes between tumor and normal that is specific to low FAM46C tumors. Um, and this was with RNA-seq analysis. And she's actually identified an ion channelopathy that may make those tumors more able to survive in a hostile environment in vivo. So another way that we've been looking at patient-derived material and modeling this um, in the lab has to do with peritoneal metastasis. And this is the work mostly of Deanna Ng, who is in the audience beside Saf Brar. Shout out to Deanna. Uh, peritoneal metastases from gastric cancer are notoriously difficult to treat and cause a lot of uh, symptoms which are um, hard to manage. And Deanna has demonstrated in a murine xenograft model that PLK4 promotes peritoneal metastasis. So you can see here when you deplete PLK4, there are fewer metastases. The mouse PCI index is lower and the tumor weight is lower uh, when you've depleted PLK4. And so she did a very interesting series of experiments using human peritoneum to model this process of peritoneal metastasis. So this is peritoneum coming from the uh, falciform ligament in an individual patient, cultured in a Petri dish, and then used to set up um, an implantation model where we have gastric cancer cells here in red that have to get up to this peritoneum and then implant and invade into it and resist washing off. And then they're then visualized over the course of a few days. Um, so she's done proof of principle to demonstrate that um, this is actually what she's visualizing is specific because when you restore e cadherin, these cells don't uh, implant and invade as much as they did before. So you can see that here. And she's gone on to show that pololite kinase 4 drives that implantation and invasion in the human peritoneal explant model. Um, one of the most uh, interesting things she's done in the recent months is to look at non-implanted versus implanted cells and compare them using RNA-seq. And she's found vast differences in the expression of various adhesion molecules and pro-invasive factors. So finally, to bring it back full circle, we're now trying to develop a interaction model where we take patient-derived organoids, patient-derived peritoneum, 
and allow them to interact in our explant model in vitro or ex vivo and see if we can define what variables are actually driving the implantation and invasion of the, this individual patient's cells into their peritoneum. So that's our dream. Um, what does a surgeon bring to the science is a big question. And Steve Strasberg emphasized this to me several decades ago, I guess. Um, the surgeon has to think about what they have to offer that is unique. So we have access to biomaterials and patient outcome data. We do the procedures that obtain these um, biomaterials. And so we have a unique understanding of where they came from and what the limitations might be in interpreting data that's derived from them. We have an integrative edge because we're there at the tumor boards. We understand all that's come before, what molecules are being complicated contemplated at this phase and where the patient is in their journey. So we're able to really meaningfully contribute to rational thinking about treatment sequencing. And also our technical intervention is a therapy. And so this is what I mean by surgeon as therapy. So I'm going to just come down to some consensus recommendations that Natalie Coburn and her colleagues have recently made with respect to gastric cancer um, management. And th this is consensus guidelines that have been issued from Cancer Care Ontario, referral to high volume centers so that we can have patients, uh, surgeons with expertise and experience and high volumes operating on patients with gastric cancer. And I just wanna show you that a key quality metric for gastric cancer management is the number of lymph nodes that are examined in the specimen when you do a curative resection. Uh, across Ontario, we've decided that the target for satisfactory lymph node assessment is 80% of cases. And you can see that when Natalie published those Cancer Care Ontario guidelines, the rate of satisfactory lymph node uh, evaluation went up. So this to me is an example of the surgeon as a targeted therapy, improving cancer care for patients, not just one by one, but uh, throughout our society. And I'm very proud to say that uh, the surgeons who are uh, forwarding this effort across Canada. Many of them are graduates of our General Surgical Oncology Fellowship Program here at the University of Toronto. So uh, I hope I've shown you that as molecular therapeutics have evolved and improved, uh, we surgeons have also been keeping up and our practice um, should be science informed and science promoting. And I think all of us should dream big in terms of what our contributions could be to improving targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and its application in the individual patient. Uh, I have a lot of people here that I want to acknowledge, but I've highlighted in red, the individuals whose laboratory projects have really formed the underpinning of all the research that I've shown you. And I wanna thank some of my uh, senior mentors as well for their contributions in guiding me um, into this work. And then a fun series of photographs to finish off with. Um, thank you so much for the honor of uh, the Lister Prize and thank you, Michael, for your kind introduction. Thanks very much. Is anybody? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, I just. Are there? Is there any chat? Um, one second. Yep. I think that's okay. still Rebecca. Yep. Should we? Should we ask Nir another question? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Let's go with it. Um, limit toxicity in pediatric and adult patients. Do you want to talk about that, Nir? <laughs> I noticed Michael brought up the spine and Rebecca's bringing up sarcoma. 
Thank you, uh, Rebecca, for the question. Um, as it happens, pediatric applications are ones we're also um, working on uh, together with the Sick Kids Neurosurgery Group, uh, specifically in, in, in brainstem tumors, which are uh, non resectable, highly malignant, uh, and uh, highly challenging. Um, so we're definitely working on that. Happy to discuss this. Uh, and please uh, don't hesitate to reach out and we can, we can discuss uh, how this could be applied to other other diseases, but limiting toxicity is one of the rationales for opening the DBB, reducing dose of the drug uh, that we're using. Um, usually, uh, especially in some diseases, Alzheimer's and others, where you're really pushing uh, the dose uh, quite high in order to get it across the BBB. If you can, if you can reduce it by by a third or or, or by more, uh, you'll be able to reduce the toxicity. So definitely a strong interest for us. Yes, Michael. Carol. This question is for, for you. And I don't know if they can hear me online, probably not, but maybe you can. I'll, I'll repeat it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is more kind of about your path. And so you're an example of someone whose PhD work has informed their subsequent research career, but it was really kind of a shift going from sepsis to cell biology. Can you maybe just kind of reflect on that and are, what, what lessons might you? suggest for the trainees who are contemplating a research career? Thank you. I think it's a very important question. Uh, so Michael's asking about, you know, do you have to, when you pick your PhD or your master's uh, topic, do you have to have your plan for 25 years from now when you finish training exactly what you want to do and pick a graduate degree a topic that is going to allow you to flourish in that exact area? And of course, the answer is no. Um, I think just, just as uh, Nir uh, spoke about at the beginning of his talk, it's really the um, cognitive discipline and the ability to think critically that is the common thread <laughs> through scientific training. And, uh, you know, I think you can Avery Nathans is an example of somebody who trained with Ori in his lab doing basic and translational science and, and then made the leap to outcomes-based research and large data use. Um, and I, I think that's, that's perfectly coherent. Um, you develop the same skills um, and apply them to a different field. So um, yes, it helps to have some expertise within a certain area, but by the time you finish your training, things are going to have changed fairly dramatically anyway in whatever you're training. Um, and so I think uh, it's always gonna be transferable. And I would, I would encourage people not to get hung up on this issue of you know, doing exactly what they think they're gonna be doing in the future, because you, you don't know. Do you know you were gonna be doing focused ultrasound? No, of course. So um, pick, pick a good mentor, pick a good project that's doable uh, in the exact field doesn't matter. Thank you for asking. Oh, another chat. Yeah, I have that uh, Chris Feindel, how a consensus screen show centers across Canada bringing about 80% from Canada per second. Was there resistance from some centers? <laughs> um, so that's, that's a good question. And I think this shows you the um, power of training a cadre of people um, who think alike and are able to then go out like a diaspora and spread the good word. Um, and really um, you have to have cooperation, collaboration, and uh, obviously uh, authenticity in your work. It can't be self-serving. But uh, I think when you have that and you have the, the trainees who graduate and then establish themselves elsewhere based on what they learned in your program, there's a huge power in that. Um, so thank you for that question, Chris. Uh, we, we came to that conclusion harmoniously and without difficulty. <laughs> okay, thanks. thanks everyone for being here. Thank you.